evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome this evening. My name is Victoria Beadle, and I'm the CEO of Melanoma Patients Australia and your host for tonight's consumer webinar, which will shine a spotlight on a very important topic to our patients and their families, and that is clinical trials. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge country and pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land and their elders, both past, present, and acknowledging um, the deep and continuing connection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to the land, the waters and sky. So um, tonight's webinar, it's the first of a webinar series brought to you in collaboration between Melanoma Patients Australia and Melanoma Institute Australia. We'll be hosting these webinars each Wednesday evening for the next three weeks. So we'd love you to join us um, on our journey over the next three weeks. Our next webinar will have a different topic. It will focus on mucosal melanoma. And our final melanoma will be on um, a very important topic of fear of recurrence. We know that many melanoma patients and their families um, face the challenge of fear of recurrence. And um, yeah, we'll be spending um, some time uh, covering that important topic in week three. You are most welcome to join us for all of these topics. However, you do need to register online for each of the ones that you wish to attend. So you can do that through um, the link that you can see on the screen now, the QR code and um, through the um, Melanoma Patients Australia website and the Melanoma Institute Australia website. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our amazing speakers this evening. We have two wonderful speakers. Our first speaker this evening will be Maria Gonzalez. And um, she's there on the screen. Hopefully you can see her. <laughs> um, Maria is now a head of clinical trials at Melanoma Institute Australia. She leads, um, she's a, leads a team of clinical trial nurses and science graduates who are responsible for the coordination of surgical medical radiation and dermatology clinics at the Post Centre at the Royal Prince Albert Hospital. And Maria is a registered nurse with more than 10 years experience. So we are very privileged to have her speaking at tonight's webinar and a very warm welcome. Our second speaker uh, this evening is Nick Moisenthal. Um, hi, Nick, welcome to the webinar. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, Nick had an in situ melanoma removed from his forearm in November 2021. And in April 2023, he was diagnosed with stage three melanoma with the melanoma spreading to the lymph nodes. Now, Nick joined the NADINA, Nadina, neoadjuvant clinical trial um, through the Fiona Stanley Hospital in April 2023. Now, Nick's based in WA and he's a member of the MIA um, group in WA. Um, he and his wife, Melinda, uh, are recently retired and they have a, a lovely daughter and, um, and, and her husband based with them over in Perth, second daughter in Melbourne. Uh, and Nick has worked as a mining engineer and Melinda as a vet. So we are incredibly grateful to Nick for giving his time this evening and sharing his personal story from a patient perspective. So um, I'd like to first um, introduce um, Maria and bring um, Maria to the screen for everybody um, to listen to her um, presentation on clinical trials. So welcome, Maria. Thank you, Victoria, for the introduction. I'm just going to commence sharing my screen. Victoria, can you see my screen there? Absolutely. Beautiful. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening for this education session. It's wonderful to see so many people have joined with an interest in clinical trials, which I absolutely love. So I thought I might begin with a bit of a COVID anecdote because I believe the COVID years have taught us a lot about clinical trials and in fact have increased the general community's knowledge about what clinical trials are and their importance. So this scene will be familiar to many of you and it's a picture of a hospital ward in the very early days of the COVID years. You can see the room is completely overwhelmed with patients it's a busy scene and we all remember that very scary time. 
So how did we get from this scene to current day um, where we're sitting here by and large, by and large COVID now behind us? And the link I'm going to draw there is in fact the clinical trial link leading us to the precious vaccines that are now proven, known to be effective, readily available for all Australians to protect against serious death and illness from COVID. The further parallel I'd like to draw now is by suggesting that, in fact, um, the process by which we have these terrific COVID vaccines that led to the drug discoveries we have had for many years in, in all diseases, including melanoma. And the clinical trial premise that led us to COVID vaccines is no different, actually, to the way that we investigate any given treatment for any treatment, for any disease. It doesn't necessarily need to be cancer. I um, have worked at Melanoma Institute for some time now. I started it in 2010. And 2010 was a very difficult time. Those early years was a very difficult time for, for patients and for people like myself looking after patients who had melanoma. That was because the standard treatments at those in those times, which was largely chemotherapy, also supported by radiation and surgery, did not work um, to save patients from dying. Unfortunately, when we met a patient with advanced melanoma, and advanced melanoma, if you don't know, is melanoma that has spread to distant parts of the body, including, including organs, meant that survival was um, not, not generally possible uh, and that most patients died within six to, six to nine months. Now, fast forward to 2021, we have many proven treatments that are effective for advanced melanoma. And in fact, we think that about 50% 50 of patients that are receiving these treatments and did so on the clinical trials, but thereafter when those treatments were approved for all patients with melanoma are saving about 50% of patients. And again, the link I'm drawing there is that clinical trials have been absolutely critical to us getting to this point. So today I would like to go through what is a clinical trial and looking at different types of clinical trials that you may encounter or may in fact be interested at any point in, um, in your treatment journeys. What to expect when participating in a clinical trial and the elements that you could become, um, could become aware of again if you do become a, a trial participant, including informed consent, um, assessing eligibility for a clinical trial, the clinical trial assessment schedule and the role of the clinical trial coordinator. At the end, we'll just take a brief look at some groundbreaking melanoma clinical trials that led us to be in this, in this position today where we feel that about 50% of patients um, are successfully treated from the drug treatments available at the moment and the future of melanoma clinical trials, and finally, how you can find a clinical trial that you may be eligible for yourself. So in essence, clinical trials look for new ways to prevent, detect, or treat disease. And like I mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily need to be cancer. The same concept applies to all diseases, but of course, today we're interested in melanoma. Treatments might be new drugs or new combination of drugs or new surgical procedures or devices, or new ways to ex use existing treatments. And that's really quite important. When we think of a clinical trial, usually we think of drug therapies and new drugs to treat melanoma. But in fact, it's much broader than that. We can do clinical trials using um, surgical te techniques, comparing surgical techniques or radiation. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be limited to, to drugs. But most importantly, the goal of a clinical trial is to determine if a new test or treatment works and is safe. And if you take anything from, from that today, um, that's the most important thing to understand about clinical trials and why we do clinical trials. Um, also, clinical trials can look at other aspects of care, such as improving the quality of life for people with chronic illnesses, such as quality of life studies and survivorship studies. So why might someone consider participating in the clinical trial? 
well, our patients are motivated by a number of reasons um, when they're considering participation in, cl in clinical trials, but I feel that there are two main categories in which um, patients may consider being involved in a clinical trial. The first is a desire to um, help patients in the future who are experiencing the same condition or same disease um, and to help future generations um, through the research being conducted now from, from going through um, the challenges associated with having a disease or, or an illness. But it also might be a way to access a new treatment um, not available otherwise. This patient here um, on the screen is Ross, and he's an advanced melanoma survivor uh, on a melanoma trial at Melanoma Institute Australia. And for him, clinical trials mean that he was able to access the best treatment that created the results he sees today, which is um, which is that he's still alive. When we think of clinical trials, particularly the development of new drug therapies, we think about the various stages that a drug has to progress through until we know that it is A, safe and B, effective so that it can be available to all patients um, outside of the clinical trial setting. The first stage is what we call preclinical research. And generally speaking, this is research that occurs in a laboratory. So patients are not involved at this stage, but we have scientists doing scientific work in a laboratory. Once the given drug, and I'm talking about drugs um, when we think about the four stages, once the drug has shown or given some confidence to the scientists and the clinicians studying a given that particular medication in the lab, this, the drug will progress to what we call a phase one clinical trial. And this is the first time that that drug is tested on, on humans. Because it's the first time that it's tested on humans, generally speaking, the study is quite small. It's about 20 to 80 patients receive that drug anywhere in the world. And the thing that we're interested about the most in that setting is, is the drug safe? And knowing a bit about the side effects that a patient may encounter when receiving that investigational treatment. If a phase one shows that a drug is safe, but is also giving some clues to the scientists and the clinicians studying that medication that there is a possible efficacy benefit, the study will progress to a phase two clinical trial. And this is where you essentially increase the number of patients receiving a given drug treatment. And this might be in the vicinity of about 100 to 300 patients. Again, we're looking at safety, but now that we're studying the medication on more patients, we can also start to focus on efficacy. Does the drug work and does its intended use proved to be the case when we're testing it on humans. Again, in fin phase two, we don't see any major safety concerns and we're starting to see some elements of safety that it does work for its intended use. The study will progress to a phase three clinical trial. Phase, clinical tri phase three clinical trials are really, really important. The reason they're important is because generally speaking, they're what we call a randomized control trial, an RCT for short. And what this means is that the investigational treatment, the new drug, is compared with the current standard. And in my next slide, I'll describe a bit more about what that looks like. But phase three trials are important because without phase three trial evidence, drugs are not approved by regulatory bodies to be prescribed to a broader population outside of the clinical trial setting. So our regulatory body in Australia is the TGA the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and when they're considering a new drug to be approved to give to all patients, they're looking for phase three evidence, so they're absolutely essential. This process that I've highlighted on this screen is an extensive process. It can take anywhere between 10 to 18 years, and it's estimated to cost about a billion dollars. Um, Sorry, I'll just step back to this trial um, development schema, which um, is important for you to know if you are considering a drug therapy kit clinical trial. I would advise that if you are considering a drug trial, have a look at what phase that study is in. 
if the trial you're being offered is a phase one trial, it's very possible that the doctors that are talking to you about that study will not have a lot of information to tell you about what kind of side effects to expect or is the treatment likely to work because it's not been studied broadly before it being offered to you. However, that is a bit different if you're considering a phase two clinical trial or a phase three clinical trial because as I've hopefully shown on this screen here, by the time we get to phase two and phase three clinical trials, we know more about the side effects and we know more about efficacy. So they might be really good questions to ask your treating medical oncologist when you're considering a trial, what information is available before this time that you're considering the trial that might help you make a decision about whether that clinical trial is, um, is a good option for you. So now looking into randomized control trials and why and how these studies are conducted. So as I mentioned before, a randomized control trial is, is a study comparing two treatments. Treatment A on this screen is our experimental treatment, the new drug treatment that is, aside from phase one and phase two evidence, un unproven. And it is compared to treatment B, the control arm. And the control arm is the current standard. So whatever it is that exists for patients um, at that moment in time, those two treatments are compared and patients are observed over a period of time. Those two groups of patients um, are monitored, as I said, over a period of time and, and um, monitored for the outcome. So if we're doing a clinical trial for advanced melanoma, stage four melanoma, we're hoping that the treatment that we give will hopefully treat that melanoma, shrink that melanoma, and actually um, ideally make resolve all evidence of melanoma disease. And so over time, what we would hope to see if a trial, if a trial drug is effective, is that those patients receiving the investigational treatment do better than those that are receiving the control treatment. You might ask, why can't all patients get the control? Why can't all patients get the experimental treatment? And the simple answer to that is, we we don't know that the experimental treatment, even in a phase three setting, is going to be effective. Unfortunately, we have done clinical trials whereby the experimental treatment in a phase three clinical trial using this randomized control model did not prove to be effective. And so it's actually completely reasonable if you're considering a phase three clinical trial to be selected to receive either one of those two treatments, either the experimental treatment or the current standard. Now, usually in randomized control trials, um, the studies are conducted in a blinded fashion. And what that means is that when you're assigned your treatment, whether it be experimental or control, you, your doctors, and the people treating you are not aware of what treatment that you're receiving. The reason that we do this is because we want to reduce the bias associated with knowing what treatment you're on so that we can monitor the effects of that study in an unbiased way. So you can expect that if you're offered a randomized control trial, the likelihood is that the study that you're being offered will have two treatment arms and you can be randomly selected to receive either one of those two but may not necessarily know what it is that you're receiving. If you are considering um, a clinical trial, the first step in, in thinking about whether or not that study is for you is having a discussion with your treating doctor. So in the case of a medical oncology trial using a drug therapy, you would be having a conversation with your treating medical oncologist. And what they will do is provide you with what we call a patient information sheet and informed consent form. An information sheet and informed consent form is quite a lengthy document that describes all elements of your participation in that clinical trial. It describes the experimental nature of the trial, why we're doing the trial, the procedures that you would expect to experience during the trial and the duration of the trial. It would also explain the benefits and the risks of participating in the study, any known side effects, if in fact we do have that information, your right to withdraw at any time, um, your carer's need to protect your confidentiality, your medical carers, I mean, need to protect your confidentiality and also in 
important contact information of people looking after you on the clinical trial. Once you've considered the patient information sheet and discussed the study at length with your doctor, um, you would proceed to various tests at the start of that study to ensure that um, the study is right for you. Now, just taking one step back, every clinical trial that, that we conduct has to be conducted in a rigorous and consistent way. And this is, to again, to prevent any biases entering the study that might alter the study results at the end. So when we run a clinical trial, every clinical trial is defined by what we call a clinical trial protocol, which is essentially the guidebook on how the researchers and the doctors looking after you are to conduct that study and to support you through the clinical trial. A really important element of the protocol is what we call the assessment schedule. And this is important to understand because sometimes when you're considering a clinical trial um, and particularly reading through the patient information sheet, the element of the patient information sheet can, can sometimes sound like your participation in the clinical trial. Uh, it can make it seem a little bit um, somewhat rigorous um, and burdensome. And again, that exists there because at the end of the day, the clinical trial is an experiment. And when you run a scientific experiment, you really need things to be very consistent so that you're not having an adverse impact on the results at the end of the study. And one of the ways we do that is by defining when patients need to return back for appointments, when patients need to re return back for treatment, and what kind of tests we will do throughout the study to monitor your, your health, to monitor is the treatment having an effect, and also to monitor for side effects. So this is just a this is just an example of of one of the studies we did many years ago. You can see in the top blue line that um, we have visits from the very first visit right across to week fifty two, and on the left hand column, um, all the various tests that are to occur at those times. Once you sign the consent form. Um, the first thing that needs to happen is a screening assessment. And this is generally speaking about a week or two weeks worth of testing. It might include scans, some blood tests, appointments with doctors to make sure that, um, that you're fit and well enough to receive the investigational treatment. Um, and that's important to know because once you've signed that consent form, it it doesn't necessarily mean that you're starting that treatment the very next day. Usually speaking, there's a screening period where all these tests occur and then the treatment starts within about a week or two once the tests, the screening tests have been completed. Another really important element to clinical trials is um, assessing eligibility criteria. So again, because we're conducting a scientific study and when you conduct a scientific study, you need to be rigorous about consistency and all patients being somewhat similar and treated in a similar way. Eligibility criteria allows us to study patients with a similar characteristic um, and it helps scientists and researchers achieve accurate and meaningful results when they do this. These criteria also make it certain that people who could be made worse by participating in the study are not as exposed to risk. So first and foremost, eligibility criteria are a set of criteria um, that define who that study is for. And the best example of this is if we've got a new drug treatment and we want to study this new drug treatment in patients with advanced melanoma, well, our first criterion would be patients with advanced melanoma, as opposed to, let's say, for instance, patients with stage two melanoma, or melanoma much earlier that has not spread, um, that has not spread distantly. The other element of eligibility criteria is trying, as, as that quote says there, trying to protect patients that might have a risk to the side effects we might expect um, from a given, a given drug. So we know, for instance, um, that some of our medications that we use can have side effects on different parts of the body. So it might affect the eyes, as an example. The criterion to protect a patient from worsening of an eye condition might state that if you have a certain eye, 
medical history of, of eye disease or an eye condition, you might not be eligible to participate in that study because it would be unsafe for you to receive that medication. So it's also there to protect patients and to optimize the benefit risk ratio. There's not a lot for you to worry about in terms of assessing eligibility criteria. This is just something that the clinicians and the and the, um, the clinical trial staff looking after you will do in the background through that screening period. And you will be kept informed throughout that screening period how that eligibility assessment is going. And if at any time um, something crops up that is unexpected that rules you out of that clinical trial, you would expect to hear very promptly from, from your doctors and the study team um, about that having occurred. But do feel some confidence that if a medical oncologist in the case of a drug trial has offered a clinical study, that they will have done so already having done a preliminary check of the eligibility and uh, knowing with some degree of certainty that you are going to be eligible with the, um, the eventual hope that you will get through that screening period and commence the study, treat the study treatment. I wanted to just touch base a bit, uh, just briefly on um, clinical trial coordinators. Um, when you're on a clinical trial, of course, you're under the care of a treating specialist who will see you at frequent intervals to make sure that the treatment is, um, is working uh, and that also you aren't experiencing significant side effects. But in addition to the treating doctor, you will also, when participating in a clinical trial, be assigned uh, a trial coordinator. A trial coordinator is a specialist person who provides care at every stage of a patient's treatment journey within the clinical trial um, and someone that is a really good contact for you at any time, in fact, not just when you're coming in for appointments, but you would have that contact information and they're people that you can call at any time if you need assistance or if you're not feeling well or something um, has changed for you. I just wanted to mention very briefly that all clinical trials are regulated very heavily. And so uh, this involves, generally speaking, a submission to an ethics committee that assess the scientific suitability of a study to go forward and also assess um, elements of the conduct of a study that means it is a safe and feasible study to be um, to be inviting patients to participate in. And of course, patient safety is our, is our number one priority when we open a new clinical trial and investigational treatment. Touching briefly, I'd love to go into the breadth of um, various clinical trials and, and how they've, they've changed the treatment field in melanoma. I don't have time, so I'll just mention two. The first one really is the study that, that really changed the game in melanoma, and it was the, the first study that showed the effectiveness of immunotherapy for patients with advanced melanoma. And of course, immunotherapy is now available to all patients with melanoma outside of the clinical trial setting. And this, this was a study that did it where patients, it was a randomized control trial of phase three, patients received either the investigational treatment, which is an immunotherapy or the standard treatment at that time, which was chemotherapy. And the results spoke for themselves. 73% of patients survived at 12 months compared to 42% of patients receiving chemotherapy. And in fact, the results were so stark that the study was closed early. Um, and then we saw very rapid approval of immunotherapy after, after this very significant study. The second study I want to highlight is Melanoma Institute Australia's ABC trial. This study was also groundbreaking. In the previous study, patients who had melanoma that had metastasized to the brain, so traveled to the brain, were not eligible to participate in that study. So we had never really done a clinical trial showing that immune therapy is in fact an active and effective treatment for patients with advanced melanoma in the brain. On this study, patients received combination immune therapy, so not just one drug, but two drugs of, of immune therapy. Um, and this is just an example of what we saw. This patient on a clinical trial had um, a brain metastasis that went from 14 millimeters at, at baseline to undetectable at month 60, and that's what we call a complete response. And indeed, the results of that study, once it was concluded, supported that finding that I've just shown you from that one patient, which is that 76% um, of patients survived um, at six months. And in fact, five years later, those patients continued to do very well. And so this is the first study that showed that immunotherapy is actually effective for melanoma in the brain. Um, so where to for melanoma clinical trials? 
at the start of this um, this presentation, I showed, you know, we're doing great work um, treating patients and curing patients, about 50% of those with advanced melanoma, but we still have 50% of patients that, that we're not curing. And so more clinical trials are absolutely necessary and critical to find something that works for the half that don't respond to the treatments that are now available. The other thing we really need to try and, and, and figure out is can we personalize the treatments and determine upfront who will respond to treatment and who will not and personalize the treatment approach so that given your own melanoma profile, you're offered the best treatment up front and are not needing to go through lines and lines of, of treatments that don't work, getting that first treatment, effective treatment up front. And in fact, we, we did some fundraising in 2022 for what we call the PIP trial, the personalized immunotherapy trial, that in fact is going to hopefully do this for the first time, understanding patients who we think are predicted not to respond to immunotherapy and treating them in a different way um, and more effectively up front without wasting any time and exposing patients to unnecessary side effects. There are various resources available for uh, patients if you want to know about clinical trials. This is one example available through the Melanoma Institute Australia website. Also, when you participate in a clinical trial, it's not just about learning about the trial, the drug's efficacy, but um, conducting what we call translational science, so learning other things about how that trial, that drug might um, affect the human body. We know through um, various studies using immunotherapies that um, the immune, uh, the microbiome plays a big response, a, a big role in um, how a patient may respond to immunotherapy and um, also the level of side effects that you may experience. Um, so if you are on a clinical trial and someone's asking you for a stool sample, that is indeed why and what we're trying to study. If you would like more information about the various clinical trials available at Melanoma Institute Australia, there is a link on this page that you can follow uh, that will take you to the MIA website page and uh, all our actively recruiting trials are listed there. If you find a study that is of interest, I uh, highly recommend talking to your treating clinician about um, seeking more information. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry, I think I've gone about five minutes over. Um, there's just a lot of content to cover when we're talking about clinical trials. So I wanted to squeeze it all in. But finally, I'd just like to thank all our patients, our clinical trial patients and um, the wonderful team of clinical trial staff and coordinators at Melanoma Institute Australia that really make it possible for us to run clinical trials in melanoma. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. That was amazing. And um, uh, look, um, it was great you went over time. I think we could have talked about that all evening because it really gives a great insight to the behind the scenes as to what happens um, in terms of um, patients accessing clinical trials the types of questions, the informed consent issues, the ethics. I mean, you went right through lots of details there. So we really appreciate that. Some fantastic questions coming in the Q&A um, um, box. I just want to encourage you to, um, to post your questions in there. We're going to answer all of the Q&As at the end after we've heard from Nick. Um, but while they're fresh in your mind, if you post them in there and we will um, we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end. I can see that our wonderful behind the scenes team are posting some really useful um, links in the chat so you can um, access further information about some of the things that Maria's talked about I in her presentation. That's great. Well, um, we might move on to our next speaker um, and um, I'd like to bring uh, Nick to the, um, to the screen and hopefully you're able to um, share your presentation and get started, Nick. Good evening, everybody. Um, just a bit of my background, and um, Victoria has alluded to my background. So uh, I retired about two and a half years ago, um, as did my wife. Um, uh, we've got two daughters, the one and her husband living here in Perth, and the other one uh, with her partner live in Melbourne. Um, we try and keep very active. So uh, we swim a lot, we snorkel, um, we do a bit of cycling, walking, we love hiking. And since um, retiring, have taken on uh, golf and bridge, 
and I've started learning the saxophone and painting and my wife the piano. Uh, we do love just spending time with the family and that photograph is, is the family. Uh, we went for a, a, a day across at Rottnest Island just off, offshore. Um, so my story, uh, back in November 2021, I had what I thought was a mosquito bite on my left uh, forearm. Um, and two weeks later, it was still itchy. And my wife said uh, that it, that's not right. I should have it checked. Went to the GP. Um, he had a look, wasn't happy, uh, sent it away. And it came back. It was a melanoma. And we had it cut out by a plastic surgeon a few days later. We we're all pretty happy it was in situ and everybody thought we were uh, said, um, you know, we're very fortunate. Uh, back in April of this year, um, my wife noticed I had a lump under my armpit. She had thought, and she'd seen it a while before, and she had thought that uh, I was just putting on a little bit of weight and uh, then felt the lump and thought, no, this isn't right. Um, Went to the GP the next day uh, who arranged an ultrasound biopsy and the melanoma had spread to the lymph node. Uh, it was quite big, the size of a golf ball. Um, and I was surprised that really I hadn't felt it before. Um, but once I knew it was there, it was easy to feel. Um, we were quite shocked uh, at that stage. It was a mo very emotional time. Um, we, at that stage, didn't know how far it had spread. Um, but I guess what helped a lot is that I, I think I accepted it at that time. Um, you know, I accepted whatever, wherever it went to. Um, I've, I felt that uh, we were very fortunate, had a wonderful family, had um, lovely life exp experiences. And so whatever, um, wherever it got to, I was, uh, I had accepted that. I, however, I was determined to do everything that was in my power to fight uh, this melanoma. Um, so the, we were referred to the Kirkbride Melanoma Advisory Service. It's a multidisciplinary uh, team here in Perth. Um, and it's uh, a panel of oncologists, uh, pathologists, um, dermatologists, and uh, plastic surgeons. And they then review your case. So I had two weeks of tests and scans. And uh, during that time, I went very, very heavily into the internet and I found the MIA extremely useful. They, the, the, and the one, the State of the Nation report for me was very important or, or very useful for me. I also joined the MIA WA support group. There, um, Angie was uh, uh, a wonderful, so helpful and 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 help, uh, welcoming, and at the MPA we had Emma who uh, was extremely helpful to me. And and again, I across the board, uh, uh, just amazing help and people just willing to go uh, bend over backwards uh, for you. So I received my PET scan results on the twentieth of April, and we were very really relieved that it hadn't uh, spread any further and that I had uh, stage three melanoma. Now, in my uh, internet research, the thing that struck me the most was this uh, chart, and it's a chart of survival rate for five years, and the top um, chart is the blue one, and that's for stage three melanoma, and it, it compares the gold standard treatment, which at the moment is, if you've got a stage three melanoma, you have surgery, and then you have 12 months of immunotherapy. Um, this trial, um, and it's the one that I was keen to get onto, um, it, it has neoadjuvant immunotherapy, which just means that you have uh, immunotherapy prior to surgery, and then it looks at the response and it tells whether you, you require further uh, response. And I guess from a layman's perspective, it does two things that immunotherapy prior, um, it reduces the tumor and the other thing uh, and I'm uh, just in layman's terms, it trains your, your body and your own immune system to attack that, uh, the cancer. Um, so accessing a clinical trial, I found um, the, as 
uh, Maria has said the, the MIA website has got a list of all the current trials. And the MPA, uh, Emma at the MPA was very useful in, in helping me uh, with some advice and, and some resources for the trials. Um, and the day after my PET scan, I had a, my first meeting with the oncologist. Um, and he was very, I asked him about trials. He was very positive on trials, uh, but said that I should have a backup of uh, surgery in case I don't get into the trial. And so he arranged for me to see the plastic surgeon that, that very same day. And the following day, I met the uh, director of the clinical trials at Fiona Stanley. The trial that was uh, available for, to me was a neoadjuvant with two treatments prior of immunotherapy prior to surgery. And if the cancer reduced to less than 10%, then there'd be no further treatment. Uh, if, if the cancer was more than 10%, then you'd have 11 months immunotherapy. So I, um, if I wanted to go into the trial, it would mean, as Maria sh uh, showed us, two weeks of further tests and scans, and then to go into the randomization process. Um, for me, uh, I had a, uh, I was booked in for surgery for that the following day. So I had to decide whether to go for uh, surgery the following day or enter into the trial. I decided to go for the trial. And so then I had two weeks of, of further tests. I went into the randomization. And fortunately for me, I was put into the neoadjuvant arm, which I was very happy about. And my treatment started the 5th of May, which is about a month after um, I first found that um, lump under my arm. Um, the experience of being a trial patient. So uh, you do meet your oncologist, uh, you have a physical exam, quite an extensive uh, suite of blood tests um, at the start of the trial, uh, before each treatment and before street uh, surgery. And you have CT scans at the start of the trial and before surgery. Um, there's a global app that uh, every week I would just enter in my um, side effects, weekly symptoms, uh, pretty easy to use. Uh, my treatment, I had immunotherapy uh, IV at week naught and week three, and the two drugs were nivolumab and ipilimumab, um, and that's about two and a half hours uh, each, uh, each of those treatments, and then surgery after uh, six weeks and results after eight weeks. Um, just in terms of other support, and, and I, th you know, I think this is extremely important, and uh, the biggest, uh, my wife and family, and, and really my wife um, put her life on, on hold for, for the six week, 16 weeks, uh, the past 16 weeks. Uh, she's uh, come with, gone with me to all the appointments and been there to give me support and assist with decision-making and take notes, really, to... Um, so extremely important and, and also the family support was great. Um, I'd, I'd heard Edith uh, or that exercise is extremely important to fight cancer. Uh, ECU uh, have got a physiology uh, um, program and I signed up for that. It meant that I went for four, four sessions per week and that's on targeted exercise for your particular uh, tumor. And uh, they recommended 30 days of, of cardio, cardio exercise on top of that. So I was on my bike um, every day, uh, uh, getting up my heart rate. Uh, I did approach a ca cancer dietitian and just made sure that I was eating this, the right foods. Um, so the Solaris Cancer Care, and it was really just to make sure or to help you and give you a full toolkit about your um, mental state and to in, ensure that you've got the best positive uh, view going forward. Uh, before surgery and, and off, uh, since surgery, I did go to a lymphedema specialist and, I've, and uh, going forward, I think that's uh, pretty important, pretty helpful. So outcomes of the clinical trial, and uh, I was extremely uh, uh, fortunate. Uh, I had less than 1% cancer in my remaining in the removed lymph nodes. 
Um, so I had a complete path, patholo pathological response. Um, and I guess that's the best um, outcome I could, I could have imagined. Um, so I have got no further treatment and both uh, myself and, and my wife are absolutely over the moon um, as are the rest of the family. So going forward, um, I just have to go for CT scans every 12 weeks. I had my first on Monday and saw the results uh, today and met the oncologist today. Um, and uh, there'd been no further spread. Uh, and uh, I'm just extremely grateful to be able to participate in the trial. Uh, and I'm so happy that, you know, I in particular had such a good response and have got such an improved prognosis. Um, thank you, Victoria. That was incredible, Nick. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, personal experience. Wow, um, what a wonderful result as well from your clinical trial participation. Um, I'd love to bring um, bring Maria back to the screen and we, um, we, we've got some questions. I think it would be great to have all, um, all of us together to go through those questions. Um, so we've got a few coming through um, in the Q&A uh, box, but I, I might start with a question for you, Nick, that was really um, triggered by um, you know, that decision you had to make. So you, you, you described um, you know, the opportunity, you had the surgery lined up, it was kind of ready to go the next day or the next week or whatever. And then you were kind of then given this opportunity. I'm guessing you got some of those documents that Marie went through, um, you know, the informed consent documents and all the information about the trial. What process did you and the family go through when you were sort of faced with that difficult decision? Yeah, Victoria, it was pretty difficult, but at the same time, uh, the the research that I'd done was so black and white, and and I just thought, if or or the, the wife and I felt, uh, you know, if we didn't go in the trial, um, the prognosis was not not very good, and I um, you know, it's, you've got a sixty percent chance of a five year survival rate, and moving up to about a ninety percent, to me, it was almost a no brainer, and and. Um, you know, the difficult part was the randomization part of it where, you know, we could have we went into the trial and we could have then just delayed um, the surgery for two weeks, um, expose yourself possibly to, you know, the, the melanoma getting away from you. But I just thought the long-term um, benefit was just, uh, I, I couldn't go past that. And really at times that, like that, you think of your family, you think of, um, you know, uh, just being there for that much longer, um, and I think that that um, it 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 made that difference. Uh, so my wife and I discussed it. We we really only had that afternoon to to make the decision, and we signed up for the trial that very afternoon because we also had to cancel uh, the surgery appointment for the following morning. So, um, but. Uh, absolutely, uh, I've got absolutely no, we are just so over the moon and, um, you know, I just encourage anybody. Uh, it was a phase three trial. Maria uh, took us through which trials they were, so it was phase three. And so we knew that it was just, um, you know, it, it, it was a lot less risky. We did, did meet the uh, trial director and he was... Uh, extremely good at, at um, telling us the benefits and, and, and giving us confidence that we were on the same path. Uh, I guess also the, the support from MPA with Emma prior to the trial and also the, even the plastic surgeon, um, when we, I, I asked him his uh, view and um, he said uh, he would recommend it. So. Right. Um, I'm going to stick with you, Nick. I'm not going to give you a break because that's kind of a follow on question that's come in through the quick Q&A. Um, one of our patients on, on, online has just asked, um, 
you know, how would you or other patients, um, if you talk to them, feel if they were not on the um, active arm of the trial? I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I guess that's probably a number one fear for patients considering clinical trials, right? Yeah, it it was, and and I I had to before we found out, and it, you know, we had two weeks of of a wait to find out whether we were. Uh, on on the on on the near adjuvant side of the trial, and I had to try and convince myself that I wasn't on the trial just so that I didn't have those expectations because I I knew that uh, you know it was I absolutely want uh, wanted it so badly, um, and so I, I had to convince myself that if I didn't get onto it, it was still a positive because. Um, I'd still have the additional monitoring and control and additional, um, you know, spotlight on me. So it, I was still in a better position than I would be being not on the trial. But it, it, it was a difficult two weeks. Yeah, big decisions. Yeah, yeah. life-changing decisions. Yeah, yeah. Really appreciate you sharing that so openly, Nick. Um, Marie, we might move to a question to you. You had a couple of questions about the informed consent process. Mm -hmm. Question around questions around you know, who informs the patients what is the standard testing versus the clinical trial treatment, um, and um, you know how how does that process work, um, and and who, who steps a patient through that decision making process? We, we, you talked about a lot of different people in your presentation. I guess it would be great for you to step it out a little bit. Who who would be helping a patient to navigate that? So during the informed consent process, you can rely or should rely on on having very open and transparent conversations with with your treating clinician. Um, Nick is a terrific example of of quality informed consent gone gone beautifully because I can tell through Nick's story that he's a very well-informed patient and, and he's had um, many conversations with doctors treating him to describe the clinical trial process, the clinical trial information sheet and not just relying on, on written information, which I think is really important. When I talk about the informed consent document, that is always supported by an interaction, a discussion with your treating clinician. And in fact, when you're navigating the patient information sheet, it's, you must read that information, um, think through all that, all the details contained with that, within that lengthy document, which I know sometimes is difficult to, to comprehend, but write down all your questions. Um, and before making that final decision to join that clinical trial, raise those questions with your, with your treating doctor. From day one, um, once you're offered a clinical trial, you will also have the contact information of a clinical trial coordinator. Clinical trial coordinators are not medical positions, um, but they can also help you navigate the process to seek more information to answer all the questions that you may have about the clinical trial that you're considering. So yes, you use a document that supports the consent process and you learning about what's involved in that study, but even more importantly than that is having conversations with your treating clinician and the doctor that has invited you to participate in the trial because they are the specialist. They understand your specific melanoma. They understand the statistics. Um, they understand melanoma and can really guide you through that process so that you can walk away and, and make a well-informed decision that, um, that you're comfortable with. That, that's great, Marie. So really lean in on the team. The team are there really to help you and support you through that decision making and understanding um, the details. Um, it kind of leads to another question that someone's asked about that some of these documents are really difficult for, for, for patients and families to understand. Um, they can be very complex, very legal. Um, um, and there's a question here around, you know, they should, about, about reading levels. You know, they really should be written to um to, to to help people um and and to increase health yeah. um is there anything we could be doing better in that space maria yeah look i'm i'm absolutely with you if you look at a clinical trial in conform consent document they're usually in excess of 20 pages um sadly however what happens when we're writing a clinical trial patient information sheet is that we follow the NHMRC 
clinical trial information sheet template. And for those that don't know, the NHMRC is the National Health and Medical Research Council. And in Australia, they're involved and actually lead the regulation of the way that clinical trials are conducted in this country. And so they have a template and, and we follow that template and all the elements within the NHMRC template is then what is produced when we run a, run a clinical trial. But this comment is, um, is so important. And in fact, uh, a lot of work is going on at the moment, various working groups getting, getting together around the country to simplify the template and do better because informed consent is absolutely critical. And it's really important that we can present complex information in a way that, that people and patients and their families can understand one thing I will say is that all information consent forms, patient information sheets, they're approved by the Ethics Committee. So an Ethics Committee has reviewed those documents before they're given to a patient and has approved us for delivering those documents to you in a consultation where we're discussing a clinical trial with you. Um, and on ethics committees, we do, there's always, there, the ethics committee is made up of various people from various backgrounds and specialties, but they always contain lay people. So people without a medical background or any medical training and those people on the ethics committee, their job is to look through the patient facing documents to make sure that the language contained with those documents are of a level that the layperson in the out there in the community can understand and comprehend. But I'm not at all suggesting that we necessarily always get it right. And that's why I think the conversations that you're having with your clinicians are really, really important. So if you're reading a patient information sheet and it doesn't make sense, it do, you don't understand, it is confusing, write your questions that, down. Your medical team, your so, clinical support team are there to help you, support you through that and answer any questions that you may have. Wonderful advice. Thanks, Maria. Um, there's a great question. I think, uh, you know, both Nick and Marie can share your um, expertise on this, but there was a question around um, the cost of clinical trials and that there's um, often a perception that if you are enrolled on a clinical trial, that everything is free and that is not always the case. It'd be interesting to know, um, uh, Nick, what your personal experience is, if you don't mind sharing, and also Maria, you know, what are, are there guidelines or... Um, protocols around the costs that patients would have to bear if they um, get accepted onto a clinical trial? Yeah, thanks, Victoria. Um, I, I guess a lot of the, a lot of the co costs are borne, and I know that the drugs, the cost of the drugs is, and it, that's a huge cost, um, uh, if, if it isn't, uh, if the drugs aren't approved for your uh, particular uh, stage. Um, I guess uh, there are, um, and I, I've got I've got medical aid, and that does pay some of the rest. Um, so I've I've uh, for the surgery, for instance, I could have gone through the through the trial and on the on on the public system, um, but there could have been possible delays. I went through the private system, so um, I paid for uh, between myself and the and the. Um, medical aid we paid for the surgery um, but I, I think apart from that I have the, and all the um, the physio exercise um, the lymph, lymphedema all that type of stuff I've paid for myself um, uh, just to, and uh, just to ensure that I give myself the best shot uh, Maria I don't know if you've got other insights yeah, so look, when you participate in a clinical trial, you can expect that any element of that clinical trial that is there for us to monitor you and to treat you as related specifically to that clinical trial will be covered by the study. And as Nick suggests, the greatest cost actually that, um, that is born from, from receiving treatment on a clinical trial um, is, is other drugs. And actually just today I found out that... Um, half a dose of one of the currently approved immunotherapies, which we used on clinical trials years ago, but is now approved for, for all patients to access is $7,000 a dose. So that is a significant cost. Where you may expect to, um, to have some costs, however, is if you receive treatment that you need specifically to treat your melanoma, and it is not specifically part of that clinical trial you're involved in. So you may be on a trial where 
the monitoring of, of your melanoma may be done using CT scan, as, as Nick has suggested is the case for him. And that's part of the clinical trial because we need to understand if that treatment is working using CT scans. However, if during the course of your treatment on that clinical trial, the doctor identifies um, something else that needs to be investigated, let's say, for instance, um, there is a change in your melanoma and want, the doctor wants to conduct further testing just to find out what this is, that testing is not specifically part of the clinical trial and is part of your management because you have melanoma, not because you're on a clinical trial. So they may recommend an ultrasound, for example, but on this study, ultrasound is not part of the clinical trial. And so sometimes they are the nuances in um, you, you, that you can find when you're participating in a clinical trial and finding that that there are ex, um, that there are expenses associated with your care. But when that is the case, um, it is usually an expense associated with the fact that you are being treated for melanoma as opposed to the fact that you're on a clinical trial. If there's any doubt, however, the safest thing to do is to talk to your clinical trial coordinator. Um, have a discussion with them about the expenses you're experiencing. Also, your treating clinician can talk you through um, those expenses if, if and when they come up. Right. So, I mean, essentially, um, you can't expect everything to be free necessarily. You really need to do your homework, talk to your treating team um, so that you've got a better sort of insight into what the costs you might incur Um and as you know, Nick, you've you made some choices there around um, allied health and other things that you wanted to invest in to improve your health and well-being that sort of sat outside of the trial. So you've got to think through those um, different options, and um, obviously it can be challenging um, um, for people. Uh, you know, all of the medical bills can rack up, so it's a real big consideration for patients. Um, I might change tack now. We've had quite a few questions in the um, in the Q and A around eligibility to get onto clinical trials. So a number of people, I think, they're thinking themselves, "Well, I've had immunotherapy already. Um, you know, for example, I've had I'm stage three and I've had Nevo. Um, you know, can you participate in a trial if you've already had?" treatments for melanoma um how do you find out more about if you're interested in getting in the onto a clinical trial um uh there's a few questions like that in the chat so marie maybe you could um you could answer that one sure um so the answer unfortunately is not a clear one because the answer is very personal to your situation your melanoma your history of treatment up until that point and if in fact there is a clinical trial available to you in that moment um, and so really that is a discussion to be having with your with your treating team, your medical oncologist, if it is in fact a drug study that you're interested in. But having said that, there's there's also clinical trials which which would allow you to access new new drug therapies irrespective of your treatment history and whether or not you have received an immune therapy. And so the most obvious way that that may happen is let's say, for example, you've received immunotherapy, um, standard immunotherapy that's prescribed to you by a treating medical oncologist outside of a clinical trial setting, and it's not working. Um, your melanoma is not responding and it's getting bigger and your treating doctor says to you, we need to change now. We need to look for something else that works. And so here at Melanoma Institute Australia, we run a lot of clinical trials and it's actually an area of intense focus for us. Um, of new drug treatments that specifically treat patients that have not had success with standard treatments, particularly immunotherapies. So having immunotherapy doesn't necessarily rule you out of a clinical trial, but it's a difficult question to answer without understanding the specifics of your melanoma, uh, where you're at with your melanoma treatment and obviously your melanoma history as well. Right. Thanks, Maria. I know we're going over a few minutes. We had so many great questions. I kind of don't want to um, stop answering them. Um, so I think we might keep going for a couple more minutes if everyone um, will indulge me. Um, we've got a great question about people living in regional areas and um, accessibility to clinical trials. If you do live in a rural, remote um, part of Australia and, you know, the fees of, for example, accommodation, if you need to attend um a major treatment centre in the city, et cetera. So, Maria, can you give any advice to our 
Sure. Yeah, it's a really important question. It's obviously something that affects many Australians who don't live in metropolitan cities. Um, and it can be very difficult if you have to travel to a metropolitan centre for, for treatment when you leave hundreds of kilometres um, outside of the area. So um, the answer is it depends. Clinical trials have set limits of funding and that funding is usually set by, um, by the trial sponsor. And so in the case of, of a drug trial, normally speaking, most drug trials, but not always, because actually the trial that Nick was on is a really good example of a non-pharmaceutical trial. It was actually a study that was developed by Professor Georgina Long at Melanoma Institute Australia. But the trial sponsor is the person that sits at the top of all the decision making and, and some of that decision making involves reimbursement for expenses such as um, regional travel. And what I would recommend to you is if you're traveling um, a lengthy distance to participate in a clinical trial and the general definition for, um, for seeking additional support is over 100 kilometers, I know that probably seems completely arbitrary, but it is sort of... Um, an arbitrary standard which exists in in the field of clinical trials is to seek whether or not the trial sponsor can support additional payments to you because of um of living in a rural or regional remote area and here at melanoma institute australia we in fact do that for patients all the time if we have a patient traveling more than 100 kilometers um and even needing overnight travel um overnight, sorry, accommodation, we will contact the pharmaceutical company who's sponsoring that trial and request that they consider supporting our patients um, with additional reimbursement for accommodation and also for travel. Um, the only exception to that might be is if we are doing a non-pharmaceutically sponsored clinical trial. And so the Nadina trial that Nick was on, for instance, that's a clinical trial that's not developed by a pharmaceutical company. And in fact, that's developed by Melanoma Institute Australia. Those studies are usually funded through grants. The trials team have to work very hard on securing grants from, from usually government, which means that there often isn't enough funding, um, enough funding there. And so the, there may be limitations on your ability to access additional support for travel and accommodation. But the safest thing to do is just ask if you're in that situation, talk to your trial team, let them know that um, that travel and accommodation is, is something that you would like support with and any good clinical trial team will take that back and, and work out every possible which way to make sure that you can be supported through, through that journey. That's great, Maria. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nick, too. Um, we'll have to um, wrap things up. Um, but um, that was an incredible session. And um, we really appreciate um, both the presentations and um, the, the great responses to our, our Q&A. Uh, we didn't quite get through all of the questions. Um, so um, there's a couple of things I wanted to sort of add to wrap up. Um, I'm going to um, just quickly um, screen share um some of our wrap-up pieces um so um i wanted to first of all um just mention that there were a few questions in the chat that were quite medical in their nature you know asking specifics around um individuals circumstances um which were which were really difficult for us to answer um in this session but i would just remind everyone that um we do have the melanoma telehealth nurse service which can help you to work questions out to ask your oncologist or treating team about clinical trials. Um, you will see in the chat, if you can have a look through in the chat, there are lots of links in there for you to look at open clinical trials, particularly through the Melanoma Institute Australia website. Um, so I would encourage you if you are um, worried um, to speak to your treating team or perhaps to make a call through to um, the Melanoma Patients Australia Telehealth nurse team, Nick mentioned that was really helpful to him when he was um, going through his uh, decision making. So I just really would encourage you to do that. And I'm really sorry we weren't able to answer those personal questions that came through the Q&A. Um, but, um, but look, um, I think the topic is so incredibly important for our patients. And, and Nick, you know, the trial that you, you're on now is is very exciting. There's been new data published, um, you know, follow-up um, um, trials from that one. And 
Um, it may well change the treatment landscape for patients in the neoadjuvant neo setting. So um, it really does show, um, you know, the impact that clinical trials can have. We know that um, the melanoma space, we've had so much um, advancement in um, treatment options over a very short time, time scale. And that has been um, driven by some of the incredible work that our um, clinicians and people like Maria and her team at um, Melanoma Institute Australia are doing to push the boundaries and barriers and to try and improve patient outcomes in the long term. So we really appreciate you both um, speaking this evening with us. Um, uh, we um, would like to remind everybody that there is support available if you need um, to reach out. We have a helpline. We also have support groups across the country at melanomapatients.org.au. Um, as I say, the MIA website has got wonderful information on clinical trials and where, how, how and where to access them. Um, we do have a survey that will follow this session and we'd love to hear your feedback on this session and um, it will help us develop our future um, webinars um, moving forward. So if you do have a few minutes um, to fill that out, we would be incredibly grateful. Um, I would like to um, let you know as well, this uh, webinar has been recorded and it will be um, shared with everybody in coming days and we'll make sure it's available on both the Melanoma Patients Australia website and the Melanoma Institute Australia website. Um, it really just leaves me with uh, one thing to say. A big thank you to Nick and to Maria for your presentations and time this evening. I really hope you've enjoyed our session and look forward to welcoming you to our webinar series um, number two, which is next week. And um, uh, hopefully you can make it same time, same place. There'll be a separate link that you will need to click on to come through to um, the next session. Um, so we encourage you to um, register for that and, um, and get involved in our full series. So on behalf of everyone at Melanoma Patients Australia and Melanoma Institute Australia, we thank you for attending tonight and would like to say good night.